Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa podcast. I'm your host, Andy. In the last episode, we witnessed the fall of the ill-fated and overambitious reformer king Radama II, as he was overthrown in a coup by his prime minister, Rani Vonina Hitratrioni, after just 20 months on the throne. Somehow, Rani von Hitratrioni's reign will be even shorter. Today, a second military coup leads to the beginning of the first period of stability since the death of Rana Faluna, and the rise of Madagascar's first military dictator. Season 4, Episode 24, The Brothers' Coup and First Malgasy Constitution The dust refused to settle after the 1863 coup to overthrow Radama II. While Radama had certainly been an unpopular figure among the ruling classes, the notion of a revolt against the sitting Mpanjaka Madagascara by mere Hufa bureaucrats was still an unthinkable prospect. Such a coup had no previous analogue in Marina history since at least the days of Andrea Massina Falona, almost two centuries ago. No matter how unpopular Renama had been, the unceremonious assassination of the king would simply never be a legitimate means of accession in the eyes of the vast majority of the Marina people. Raini Volnina Hitratrioni desperately tried to legitimize his coup regardless. Luckily, there was a perfect candidate in the wings for the prime minister to use to these ends. Radama's wife, Radubu, was a fantastic fit for what Raini Volnina Hitratrioni was looking for. Radama's adoptive children were far too young to take over the kingdom, so there were only two primary options for Radama's successor, his first wife, Radubu, or her cousin and one of Radama's secondary and lesser-known wives, a noblewoman named Ramoma. Though they were related, the two women couldn't have been more distinct in terms of their political agenda. Radubu, as we learned last episode, was a traditionalist, with her believing in strict adherence to the Merina veneration of the ancestors and the Saint-Pierre. But unlike her old mother-in-law, Rana Falona, she was also a traditionist in her adherence to traditional gender roles, conforming to Merina society's preference for apolitical and quiet women. As a result, she maintained a vast distance between herself and the political turmoil of Radama II's rule. Ramuma, on the other hand, was an active political figure. She was the brother of Rambo Asalma, the leader of the short-lived 1861 failed coup attempt against Radama, and rose to prominence by supporting her husband and actively denouncing her brother. Fittingly, for a stern supporter of Rana Falona, it was also an open secret that Ramuma harbored deeply held Christian sympathies. Now, Raimi Vonina Hitretroni was not an anti-Christian, nor was he especially conservative. He was a firmly entrenched member of the reformist faction of government, but just happened to be less radical than Radama. At the end of the day, he probably had more in common with Ramuma when it came to their political views. However, Ramoma's politically active personality would make her much harder to use as a puppet, while her ideological parody with her late husband made elevating her a very risky choice. Due to these factors, Raini Fonina Hitratrioni threw his support behind the ascension of Radobo as they knew Mpanjaka Madagascara. As part of a long-standing tradition, she changed her name upon her ascent to the throne, taking the new title Rasu Herina, meaning Crystalis or Cocoon, a fitting name for a woman known for her political inactivity. Furthermore, as was tradition, she was soon married to her prime minister, becoming the wife of Raini Vonina Hidratrioni. The most significant development related to the rise of Raso Herina to the monarchy, however, was certainly the curious document which her new husband demanded that she sign. This odd document laid out a series of demands governing the monarch's behavior, their succession to power, and a list of rights of the people of Madagascar which the monarch could not obstruct. This was to be Madagascar's first written constitution. In my research, I was unable to find an original copy of the document, if one exists. Despite the monumental status of the document in Malgasi history, there is, as far as I know, no surviving original copy. Our only awareness of its contents come from a summary done by missionary William Ellis, the same LMS missionary known for his photographs of the former Emperor Radama. In his summary, Ellis quotes the constitution as such. Article 1. The sovereign shall not drink spiritous liquors. Article 2. 
There shall be freedom of intercourse and trade with subjects of other countries, and liberty and protection are guaranteed to all foreigners who obey the laws. Article 3. Duties are to be leveled on exports and imports, and commerce and civilization are to be encouraged. Article 4. Domestic slavery is not to be abolished, but masters may choose to give freedom to their slaves or sell them to others within the country. Article 5. The military force of the country is to be upkept. Ellis does not quote the remainder of the Constitution, and instead he makes indirect reference to a few other crucial articles within its text. These articles included the affirmation of the abolition of the Tangena ordeal, the guarantee that no person may be executed unless they are found guilty by a jury of 12 men, that the noble and bureaucratic classes of the country must be allowed to participate in the making of laws, that the death penalty could only be used at all in cases of great crimes with the consent of the nobility, that heirs to the emperorship had to be approved by the nobility before their elevation, and finally, guaranteed freedom of religion. Now, strangely enough, the Constitution of 1863 rather than a well-thought-out foundation for a future political order, reads like an ad hoc checklist of which of Rodama II's policies Rainivo Nina Hitratroni agreed with and which ones he denounced. The provisions requiring bureaucratic approval of new laws, the preservation of the system of slavery, the demand for a well-funded military, and the requirement of trade duties were all direct repudiations of Rodama II's old agenda. Even the conspicuous ban on liquor consumption for the monarch, which, mind you, is the very first article in the Constitution, was rooted in the bureaucracy's belief that Radama's abuse of alcohol was partially to blame for his many controversial decisions. Furthermore, many of the elements of the Constitution retroactively labeled Radama's recreation of the Lambert Charter to be unconstitutional. In fact, the government had demanded that a French diplomatic envoy would have to be present for the treaty signing, and then immediately following their presence, would have to then head to Tormasina and destroy the original Lambert Charter document. After a long series of negotiations, they obliged, setting the original Lambert Charter on fire. While this obviously didn't literally delete knowledge of the treaty's contents from everyone's memory or records, the fire was a potent symbol of rejection. A few elements of the Constitution, however, such as the requirement of a jury in capital trials, the prohibition of Tangana, and freedom of religion, were long-coveted reformist policy goals. The Empress's signing of the Constitution marked, in this regard, a permanent victory for the reformists on these matters. And, while changes in how they are interpreted will happen, the basic principles of the 1863 Constitution will remain the governing ideals for Madagascar, for better or worse, until the end of its independence. The age of the constitutional Marina monarchy had arrived. But while the constitution would last, Raini Volnina Hitaritroni and its other architects would not. It turned out that no matter how much Raini Volnina Hitaritroni tried to legitimize it, the assassination of a sitting emperor was simply not something which the political establishment would ever be willing to overlook. Almost immediately following the 1863 coup, a new plot began to foment among the country's military officers to remove the prime minister from power. And, in a dramatic twist, the leader of this plot was none other than the commander-in-chief of the Malgasi army, the brother of the prime minister, Raini Layarifuni. Meanwhile, Rasu Herina herself had not been very happy with her treatment, you know, seeing her husband murdered and then forced to marry one of the assassins and then relinquish much of her own political power, it would turn out that she wasn't quite the easy-to-manipulate puppet that the Prime Minister had hoped she would be. Behind the scenes, Rasu Herina gained knowledge of the plot and agreed to support it, covertly building acceptance for the plot among the members of the royal bureaucracy who had not taken part in Radama's assassination. After several months of lying low and slowly building their power, July of 1864 arrived, and the plot was sprung. On that day, Rasu Herina, Raini Layarifuni, and several armed guards abruptly burst into the royal palace and announced that Raini Vonina Hitritroni was fired. If he tried to do anything to dispute his firing, the military was more than ready to use force against him. Caught with little support and sensing the end of his political career, Raini Vonina Hitritroni reluctantly accepted his dismissal and went to live a quiet life in a rural village. 
for now at least. Due in large part to the Queen's months of secret building of support for the plot, Raini Laya Rifuni was able to seamlessly slide into power as the new head of government. Within days, he married Queen Rasoherina and replaced his brother with the title of Prime Minister. Despite the fact that he had just forced his brother out of government, Raini Laya Rifoni was actually quite similar to his brother in terms of political ideology, if not governing style. For this reason, despite the major change in government, the general trajectory of Malgasy domestic policy, well, remained mostly on the same course. Now firmly in power, Raini Laya Rifuni could now sit down to govern his new country. The most urgent matter facing the new prime minister was to bring the still free-falling Malgasy economy back to a state of stability and eventually back to a state of growth. Just five months after taking office, Raini Laya Rifuni and Rasu Herina announced the resumption of Fanampuana service. Royal agents restarted the long dormant labor draft. With newly replenished units at their disposal, the Fanampuana were primarily dedicated to work in the two industries which would prove key to Raini Laya Rifuni's plan for the economic redevelopment of Madagascar. For starters, he wanted to address the problem which had played a major role in frustrating previous attempts at economic development. That is, transportation. As far back as Radama I's earliest industrialization attempts at Amoranke, transportation had been the primary factor holding back the economy. Radama I had briefly tried to improve the poor state of roads in the country, but his successor, Rana Faluna, had actively backslid on the matter as she feared that high-quality roads would serve as a readily available invasion route for foreign armies. Beyond roads, there were a few canals and navigable rivers, but none that reached the main economic political hub at Antanarifu or the main port at Tuamasina. Raini Lairifuni rapidly deployed the Fanampuana in his effort to relieve the crippling transportation problems. Fanampuana units were deployed to fix roads and bridges, improve port infrastructure, and, most importantly, began providing large numbers of porters free of charge to Madagascar's emerging industries. Additionally, the Malgasy government bought a commercial steamship from a foreign company, christening the first modern vessel of the Malgasy fleet, the Antanarifu. This ship would steam to various sites around the southern Indian Ocean in its era, mostly traveling to Natal, South Africa, and Mauritius. Strangely enough, Raini Lairifuni was largely uninterested in the prospect of rejuvenating Madagascar's once promising manufacturing sector. While much of the infrastructure was still in place, given that they had only been abandoned barely a decade prior, the sheer amount of capital that would need to be invested for no immediate payoff to revive this industry ensured that a revitalization of the Mantasua complex was off the table. Rather, Raini Lairifuni sought to invest in a sector which promised more immediate gains, natural resource extraction. Madagascar possessed a few key natural resources that were highly coveted on the global market. And, crucially, the desire for these natural resources excited potential foreign investors far more than investing in Malgasy domestic industry. The resource most ripe for exploitation was tropical wood. In the early 1860s, global tropical wood prices were rapidly on the ascent. The luxury furniture industry was growing at a torrid pace across the world, while aesthetic tastes in Europe and the Americas were shifting to favor darker and richer tones of wood. Madagascar contains several species of trees perfect to fit this new aesthetic, such as African mahogany, ebony, sandalwood, and the most precious of all, rosewood. The lumber industry had been a notable sector of the Malgasy economy for quite a while now, and had reached international markets in large quantities for the first time during the Rana Falona era when a company owned by Napoleon de Lastel had been granted a monopoly by the Malgasy government. However, following Rana Falona's embargo of Western Europe in the 1850s, lumber exports had collapsed. To Raini Lairifuni, the Malgasy timber sector was a waiting-to-be-tapped gold mine, but only if he could find someone to export to. So his next step was clear. He needed to open up customers around the world. Now, trade with the European powers had been in a nebulous state since 1863 with the revocation of the Lambert Charter. European, Malgasy, and mainland African merchants alike weren't exactly sure who was and was not able to purchase or sell which goods, resource rights, or real estate on Madagascar. Raini Lairifuni sought to iron out this uncertainty by forming a new treaty with Britain. 
Diplomatically, these new negotiations went fairly smoothly. But while Britain was easy, reaching a treaty with France would be a much harder case. Now, we're going to take a brief pause before coming back to the history so we can get a word from this episode's sponsors. French merchants and state officials had been eager to take advantage of Madagascar's resources following the introduction of the Lambert Charter, only to have the rug suddenly pulled out under them in 1863. As a result, while the British were simply happy to have access to Malagasy markets again, the French were quite resentful about the potential power in the region that they had lost. And as a result, were pretty hesitant to resume trade with the Malagasy. Eventually, though, Raini Lairifoni's foreign ambassador managed to extract an agreement from the French. France agreed to resume normal trade relations with Madagascar on the condition that the Malagasy government paid a sizable cash indemnity. While the indemnity was officially justified as compensating French firms for losses incurred from the revocation of the charter, the sum almost certainly exceeded the amount necessary to compensate these quite small number of firms. At least to me, the inclusion of the compensation clause feels more punitive than anything else. It was meant to be a way for France to disincentivize Madagascar from inconveniencing French merchants in the future, as well as a way for France to save face from the humiliating diplomatic defeat they had suffered in 1863. Now, Raini Lairifuni was initially quite hesitant to pay such an enormous sum, especially when Madagascar's government was already in quite a turbulent financial situation. But he ultimately figured that, if the government was going to get out of that turbulent situation, that the potential profits from reopening trade would surely outweigh the initial costs. He ordered the indemnity to be paid. But while he was officially cooperating with French and British merchants, Raini Lairifumi was also secretly looking to break Madagascar's status as stuck between the Franco-British duopoly. His plan to escape involved selling Malagasy goods to a new and enormous growing overseas market, the United States of America. Just prior to the arrangement of a treaty with Britain, the Prime Minister had also signed a treaty with the United States. All three of these treaties, with France, Britain, and the USA, were pretty similar in their content. Foreign merchants could freely trade, rent, and lease land. They could travel freely and invest in local businesses. Each nation also received most favored nation status from the other, meaning that all of these benefits were symmetrical. Malagasy traders, for example, could lease and trade in the United States just as easily as Americans could lease and trade in Madagascar. There was only one sole exception to this free movement clause, the historically and religiously sacred city of Ambohimanga, in which foreigners were explicitly banned from entering as per the treaties. Finally, all three nations agreed to recognize the government in Antanarifu as the sole sovereign power over the entirety of Madagascar. Keep this in mind, as it will 100% come up later. In the following decades, Raini Lairifuni would also conclude similar treaties with Italy, Germany, Denmark, and Sweden. Whether or not these commercial treaties can be labeled as a success per se is not super clear. The treaties had three goals in mind, to increase export, improve foreign investments, and diversify trade. Now, two of these goals were obviously fulfilled as complete successes. The reopening of trade through these treaties led to an enormous flush of foreign investment in the later part of the decade. A few French, but primarily American and British firms began investing heavily into the Malgasy logging and forestry industries, supporting the export of not only precious timber, but also of various small shrubs and succulents used in medicine. The treaty also succeeded in increasing trade diversity. For reference, in 1864, the French and British split control over Malagasy trade essentially equally between each other, with each country receiving about 50% of western-bound exports from Toamasina. By 1870, three years after the signing of the treaty with the USA, exports to America grew from a marginal, practically non-existent quantity to over 6% of all exports leaving Toamasina. By 1879, American purchases of Malagasy exports exceeded French purchases for the first time, with Americans buying 40% of Malagasy exports at Tormasina that year. Within just two decades, the duopoly of trade was broken. But while the other two factors were major successes, when it came to increasing exports, it was more complicated. Many factors, most of which are admittedly outside of the Malagasy government's control, 
ensured that there was no major leap in imports or exports following the treaties. While the year immediately following the ratification saw a slight increase, the year 1869 saw a major crash in foreign trade with Madagascar. That year, thousands of miles away on the other side of the African continent, the Suez Canal was completed in Egypt. This canal fundamentally changed world history, and Madagascar would be no different. The Suez Canal joined the Red Sea to the Mediterranean, which opened a crucial new trade route between India and Europe. The newly opened canal route was significantly shorter than the traditional route around the Cape of Good Hope. While this was very convenient for European merchants hoping to trade with India, the new route bypassed Madagascar entirely, leading to an enormous slump of merchant visits to the island. Ships sailing between Europe and India had, for centuries, served as one of the main sources of maritime traffic in Malgasy ports, with Malgasy merchants selling food, hides, and timber to passing ships. Now, with the canal completed, the only ships which continued to take the longer route were those which were too large for the canal, meaning that a significant portion of maritime traffic could now move between Europe and India without even considering the idea of passing through Madagascar. So, Malagasy exports fell by nearly a quarter in 1869, before slowly recovering over the next several years. Due to their coinciding with the opening of the Suez Canal, it's difficult to label the trade treaties as straightforwardly successes or failures. I think it's fair to label them as certainly more successful than not, given how they did achieve diversifying trade partners and increasing foreign investment, while the failure to improve export numbers was primarily due to factors unrelated to the treaties and outside the government's control. Raini Lairifuni's government also sought to reorient his country's labor economy to better fit with the concept of a global market economy. One of the problems which had long faced Madagascar's economy was the prevalence of unpaid labor, which dramatically hampered the emergence of a widespread consumer class. Not only did the drought of consumers hurt local Malgasy craftsmen, it also strongly reduced the incentive for foreign merchants to come to Malgasy ports, as they could not expect to find strong demand for their products among the locals. Finally, the practice of forced unpaid labor was, ironically, quite expensive in the long term. The savings of labor costs were arguably offset by the enormous military spending needed to keep corvée and enslaved labor in line. Not to mention the cost of raids from communities of former escaped slaves and Fanampuana deserters. Raini Lairifuni, ever the reformer, sought to limit these systems as much as he could. But while the prime minister was a reformer, he was also ever the pragmatist. Not only did he know that his own government relied heavily upon Fanampuana, but he also knew that excessive upending of the status quo could create resentment among rural slaveholders. Not to mention, slave ownership was now a legally enshrined right in the Malgasy constitution. And to top it all off, beyond his government affairs, Raini Lairifuni was himself a prolific owner of enslaved workers. So the Prime Minister opted for a cautious and limited approach to reducing the prevalence of unfree labor. For starters, he relaxed certain elements of the Fanampuana, adding an exemption by which people could choose to pay higher monetary taxes to make up for their lost labor. Then, in 1877, the Prime Minister declared one of the most consequential policies in Malagasy history. He announced the end of the enslavement of the Makua, or mainland Africans brought to Madagascar. Hundreds of thousands of mainland Africans, once stuck in the system of slavery, were now considered free members of Malgasy society. Not only did this give Raini Lairifuni a convenient way to transform a portion of the enslaved population into free workers without appearing to be universal emancipation, it also provided international prestige to his government. The active enslavement of Makua and Madagascar was essentially a diplomatic stain on the kingdom one which dramatically hurt the perception of Madagascar in the wider world, which, at the time, was becoming increasingly hostile to the practice of chattel slavery as a whole. So, the 1877 emancipation of the Makoa killed many birds with one stone, increasing the population of free workers and consumers in Madagascar, reducing state funds spent on enforcing slavery on enslaved workers, lowering the number of potential recruits to runaway republics, and further bolstering Madagascar's image as a modernizing, progressive nation. For now, the economic future of Madagascar remained in a nebulous state. 
but the government at least now had a clear plan on how to move forward. Rather than pursuing autarky in a self-sufficient consumer goods market, Raini Layarifuni's Madagascar exported large sums of raw materials to Europe and America in exchange for importing finished goods from Europe and America. As part of the strategy, Raini Layarifuni also needed eyes to give him frequent updates about the price of goods in crucial locations. The Prime Minister sent out embassies to various countries around the world, as well as hiring locals within these countries to provide economic insights on the price of Malgasy and local products alike. Such embassies were set up in nearby islands like Réunion and Mauritius, but even as far afield in major mercantile hubs like New York, London, Paris, and Marseille. With these embassies in place, Raini Layarifuni would always have up-to-date information on which sectors to invest in and divest from. We'll see more of how Raini Layarifuni's economic plans progress in our next episode. But just as Raini Layarifuni was finishing his treaties with Britain, France, and America, a returning rival made one final effort to unseat the Prime Minister. In a twist that fooled nobody, it turned out that the old Prime Minister Raini Vonina Hitritreoni was not actually going to give up his political ambitions for a peaceful life. For the last several months, the former Prime Minister had been accumulating allies in a bid to retake power. Raini Vonina Hitritreoni's motives varied by different reports, with some claiming that he sought to overthrow the monarchy altogether and declare a republic while others claim that he wanted to appoint a Christian puppet king who he could rule through, while several others claim that he was merely a pawn in a grander conspiracy arranged by a cabal of Methodist missionaries. But regardless of his reason, the former prime minister and a small group of sympathetic soldiers and former bureaucrats, many of whom were men disgraced and fired by his brother, as well as a great number of Protestants egged on by hopes of an officially Christian kingdom, began stockpiling arms for a putsch. However, they would have to wait for the perfect moment to spring their attack. In late 1867, the Empress Rasuherina, still in her mid-fifties, caught a severe case of dysentery. The disease continually worsened with each passing day until, by early 1868, it was abundantly clear that this disease was going to claim Rasuherina's life, and that it was only a matter of when. Rumors trickled out of the royal palace, but to the public, they were just rumors. They weren't sure who to believe. Fearing what could happen if the public knew of the queen's infirm status, Raini Layarifuni hurried the queen away to Amohimanga, where she could try to recover away from the public eye. However, there was one major factor complicating Raini Layarifuni's plan. Fanorona, the largest single Malgasi public holiday, was approaching. At the start of every Malgasi New Year, the Mpanjaka Merina had always performed the ceremony of the royal bath. But when the big day finally came, Rasuherina was conspicuously absent. As per every year, there was an enormous crowd assembled outside of the royal palace, and imagine the shock and the confused crowd when, instead of the queen, the prime minister approached them and delivered an awkward speech noted for its implacable lack of convincingness. He assured the crowd that the queen was doing just fine, and that she would love to be here for the ceremony. She was admittedly a little bit under the weather, but don't worry, she's in generally pretty good spirits and health. Rather, she was only missing the festival due to her doctor's advice that she should leave the city and get fresh air out in the countryside. After what was surely an awkward reception from the crowd, the Prime Minister promptly left Antanarifu to rejoin the Queen. In an immensely unlucky twist, Raini Layarifoni himself caught the illness, meaning that he too was out of commission for the next several weeks. The awkward speech in Antanarifu had confirmed what the public had long suspected. Despite the Prime Minister's unconvincing claims otherwise, the Queen was seriously ill, and she was probably going to die. For the conspirators, a more perfect opportunity for a coup couldn't have fallen into their lap. After two more months of waiting, just to ensure with certainty that the Queen was not recovering quickly, the conspirators launched their coup. They stormed the royal palace and, after a clash of cannons and guns, overpowered the guards, and even took the captain and several important palace ministers hostage. It seemed like the plan was going off without a hitch, but things started to go awry when, somehow, that royal guard captain managed to slip away from his captivity and made a dash to Amboimanga. Halfway to his destination, the captain met a messenger from Raini Layarifumi. The Prime Minister had heard the cannon fire from the palace all the way at Ambohimanga, 
and was mobilizing to fight back. The captain, understanding the implied order, began moving from town to village, informing the locals of the treacherous coup against the queen, and raising a force to retake the palace. The captain managed to quickly cobble together a respectable militia, and marched in Antanarifu. There, he continued recruiting among the city's population, until the conspirators suddenly found themselves surrounded by an angry mob of thousands of people. Recognizing that the government was not as prone to collapse as they had hoped, the conspirators laid down their arms and surrendered. The former prime minister and his allies were then arrested. Finally, in order to secure the unstable aftermath of this abortive coup, the ministers collectively agreed that Rasu Herina should make one final appearance in Antanarifu. The queen, now visibly on the verge of death, was dragged into the city on a palanquin. In an effort to cover up the sheer state of the queen's declining health, a team of guards patrolled the area just ahead of the royal palanquin and ensured that all windows were shut and all streets were empty. The citizens would hear of her arrival, but they could not see her. The twenty most prominent leaders of the coup were gathered together in a trial, with the queen sentencing them their punishment. Now, executing a group of primarily Christian rebels would look bad, especially for a government trying to rebrand itself as friendly to European countries. Any execution of Christians, for whatever reason, would be smeared in European presses as they returned to Rana Feluna's persecutions. Instead, the Prime Minister and Queen offered official leniency, while essentially condemning the men to death in all but name. The men were given a life sentence in a sad, hole-in-the-ground prison. With no windows and only a shred of natural light escaping through a tiny hole in the ceiling, the conspirators spent the following years in a slow, torturous demise. Honestly, an executioner's axe would have been far more merciful. As everyone had expected, Rasu Herina passed away only a few days after the sentencing of the conspirators. Raini Laya Rifuni had weathered the 1868 coup, and luckily, so did her cousin and heir. Rasu Herina's last words were a simple request for her cousin, adopt the royal children and raise them as her own. Ramuma agreed. Finally, Rasu Herina allegedly also conducted a last-minute baptism, converting to Christianity on her deathbed, taking the title of the first Christian monarch of the Kingdom of Madagascar. But strangely enough, in the aftermath of an abortive coup by mostly Christian elements, Madagascar would not slide back into an era of persecution. Rather, it would be Ramuma who would do the most to further the Christian religion on the island. Join us in our next episode, as we examine the reign of Ramuma, or as she will soon be known, Rana Faluna II, a woman who proved the opposite of her namesake in almost every manner, for better or worse. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like our show, then we would greatly appreciate if you could help support the show and our project of freely available online history education. You can do this by supporting us at patreon.com slash historyofafrica, providing us a rating or review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or iTunes, or by sharing the podcast with anyone who you think might enjoy learning about African history. This episode is brought to you by supporters on Patreon, including Naomi Kanakia, Ayo Fagbamie, Dimitri, Emmanuel Zaudi, Alexander Travis, B.B. Milliam, Conrad Schwenke, Travis Bell, Johnny Knowles, Godfrey Sebelabie, Evan Edwards, Pascal Makocha, Joe Maxwell, Nkechi Nwadike, Sheyun Oloronti Main, Kwachua Manqua, Douglas Harder, Craig Bolton, Samuel Badou, Rassan Firgiani, Niti, Kitty, and Tariq Beetleman, among others. Thank you all for supporting the show. It really, really, really means a lot.